Hello and welcome to Animal Park. I'm Ben Fogel and today I'm out in Kenya with some of the longleaf keepers and we're going to be going out into the bush to see some of the animals they care for out in the wild. And from Wiltshire, I'm Kate Humble. Now, while Ben is sunning himself in Kenya, I'm going to bring you all the latest stories from Longleat House and the Safari Park. Here's what's coming up on today's programme. I'm tracking rhino with the keepers in Kenya, but who's hunting who? You don't argue with an ostrich when he's got his pecker up at Longleat. I wouldn't want to step off the truck right now and, and approach honey in any way, really. And there's certainly more bounce to the ounce with this African baby. She really is frisky like a little dog. I mean, yeah, jumping up and down play. a bit. <laughs> it's just a little bit heavier. <laughs> and we're going to start out in Africa, where the keepers from Longleat have arrived in central Kenya. Most of the animals back in Wiltshire come from Africa. And the keepers are here both to study them in the wild and to support the work of a charity called the Tusk Trust, which is devoted to saving Africa's endangered species. Keith Harris, how are you? Keith, how do you do? Keith Harris is head warden of the safari park. I've worked with these type of animals for 30 years now, and to come here and, and, and see it, it, it it's, it's, it's something in your heart a little bit. It it's just grows up with you. Um, and it's so important that we, we help save these animals. While the Tusk Trust works to conserve animals in the wild, Longleat plays its part by raising endangered species in captivity and perpetuating their genes through international breeding programmes. Keepers Andy Hayton and Mark Ty, who've come out to Africa, also want to spread the word. We've got to let people know, Longleat and, and other collections are there to let people know what's going on out here. You know, our animals are kind of ambassadors for these guys. You hear about conservation all the time, and I just thought it would be a really fantastic experience to actually come out, maybe be involved, and actually see where the money goes. One species that the Safari Park have helped to conserve is the southern white rhino. They were once slaughtered on such a wide scale that there were only a few hundred left, but through conservation, their numbers have now recovered to over 10,000. Unfortunately, a single rhino horn can still fetch as much as $3,000 on the black market. So protected conservancies like Lewa in Kenya are vital. There are 76 rhinos here, and it takes 17 armed guards, 74 rangers, and over a million dollars a year to keep them safe. In most of Kenya, White rhino have been completely wiped out. So operations like today's to reintroduce them into other protected areas are vitally important. The Longleat Keepers are here to help. It's a very big day here at the Lewa Conservancy. The sun's only just risen, but already this place is a hive of activity because today we're heading out to find, capture, and then relocate two white rhino to another conservancy called Kigio. Now, this is a very difficult and dangerous task, and we're going to be helping. 150 miles to the south, the Kigio Reserve forms part of the Great Rift Valley. This 3,500-acre sanctuary is where the rhino will be moved to to establish a new breeding program. Chris Campbell-Claws, who manages the reserve, is eagerly awaiting their arrival. To me, I'm thrilled because the Rift Valley haven't seen rhino here for a long, long time. As a child, I saw rhino here. Uh, it's difficult to explain to a younger generation that we haven't got what we used to have here. Uh, and it's, it's phenomenal, the fact that we're just bringing back a species that has been exterminated from this area. With so much at stake, today's operation has been carefully planned. Back at the Lewa Reserve, Richard Moller, the Security and Wildlife Coordinator, is leading the capture team. It's absolutely vital that it goes right. We're dealing with an endangered animal, and there's absolutely no shortcuts at all. Every, everything has got to be done right. Um, if there's any potential danger to that animal, we, we call it off and think again. 
Catching wild rhino out in the bush is a very large-scale exercise. Including the keepers from Longleat and armed trackers, there are over 30 of us involved in the attempt to catch and load two animals into specially made containers for the journey south. They can be a potentially very dangerous animal. Um, when, they, when a white rhino does lose its temper, it, it loses it full on. Um, you, you've got the potential of being tossed and with horn that can be anything up to two and a half plus feet, you're obviously in big, big trouble. A spotter plane radios into Richard. The two young rhinos he wants have both been seen, but they're miles apart. You know, we, we spotted a female from the aeroplane this morning, um, exactly the animal that we want, but uh, unfortunately it's in, it's in pretty difficult terrain. Um, very hilly terrain, uh, potential for everything to go horribly wrong. So we're, we're waiting for that one to come down onto the lower land. So we might as well go for, for this one first. It's in a relatively good position. Um, it's quite close to the swamp, which is a bit of a worry. Again, there's a lot of potential risks. One serious danger is that the young male is in a group, which includes a dominant animal. This could mean big trouble. Encroaching on his territory could provoke a charge in seconds. Richard and vet Francis Gakunga from Kenya's Wildlife Service need to get amongst the rhino and sedate the one they want using a dart rifle. But simply preparing the sedative can be a lethal job. Just one milligram of this drug is enough to kill a human being, so the best thing is to be as wary as possible. Even as you don't, you don't even want it to, to spill anywhere near, near in, on the skin or somewhere. With all firearms, you always stay behind the, the person with the firearm. There's always potential for an accident to happen, and, and you don't want to be in front. That dart is as lethal as a bullet. They're literally just 150 yards just up here. You can see them. Um, and we'll, we'll just bimble in there quite slowly and uh, hope, hope that we don't spook them. So just how do you catch a two-ton rhino without getting hurt? Safety-wise, you're dealing with a potentially dangerous animal that, that you know, can definitely kill a human very, very easily. You stay, stay in the car, and only once the animal is down and, and stabilised uh, can, can people actually um, come and get involved in, in the reviving and, and putting into the crate. The Longley keepers and I are standing by with the loading team, but our camera crew is in the front line. The head of the anti-poaching unit, Michael Tosho, is well prepared. Now, I have with me here, uh, this rifle is 458, and the bullet is as, as big as this, more powerful. It's good for big animals like rhinos, elephants, and buffaloes. In case of any risk, I will take the necessary precaution. Rhinos have poor eyesight, but they hear very well. The group are aware of our car, but so far, they don't feel threatened by it. Francis has a clear shot. The dart has gone, the, the drug has gone subcutaneous. You can see the plunger in the dart has released the, the drug, but the needle is still sticking out by approximately half of the length of that needle, which suggests that it's subcutaneous rather than intramuscular. It means that the drug will take a lot longer to take effect. Um, you see why that animal's a good animal to move? You can see this dominant male doesn't like it around. And it's only a matter of time before they have serious clashes and, and that one will be, could possibly be severely injured. The dominant male isn't just a threat to his young rival. The vehicle is in his territory too. This one here actually hits the car quite often. He's probably hit more cars on lower than any other rhino. The big male is eyeing up the car. The situation is very dangerous now. 
but the youngster's still not out cold and he needs a second dose of sedative. We're just going this side, so, you know, you've got the swamp over here. It, it, it's, a, it's a bad scenario if it goes this way, so we're just going this side to cut it off if, if it started to head this way. It could go in the swamp, go down, and then, you know, then its mouth is in, in the water and drown. He now wants to, wants to have a go at us. Are we in trouble? Possibly, yeah. It was like about a couple of inches. <coughs> I've never been so scared in my life. To everyone's relief, the male abandons the challenge and the backup team sees the group off. Meanwhile, the youngster is looking very unsteady on his feet. He's stepping as if he's had quite a few beers. A towel over his eyes will help to calm him down and make it easier to rope him. But even semi-sedated, he just keeps on going. It's time to move in. He can't be allowed to get away now. He'd almost certainly plunge into the swamp and drown. It's a tug of war to save him from himself. And it takes 12 men to stop him. We'll be back later to see what happens. Back in England, they had a bleak day in the Tiger House recently when the keepers had to face the possibility that both of the tigresses might die. Safari Park vet Duncan Williams had removed a tumour from Shandy only a few months before, but unfortunately, the cancer had come back. The mammary growth is just its as big as it was before. It's ulcerated again. To spare her from any more pain, Shandy had to be put to sleep. Kadu nearly died the last time she had a general anaesthetic, but Duncan had to risk it again to operate on her infected, ingrowing claws. She survived, thank goodness, and keepers Bob Trollope and Brian Kent think they know why. This time we've done it slightly different. Yeah. She wasn't given so much of the drug. Um, so she wasn't as deep as she was previously. Yeah. And as you know, it's a quick operation. You know, just get in there, clip all the claws, yeah. a quick check over how she is, and then out again, give her the revive on. And this time round, um, she's up and about within half an hour. Oh, that's fantastic. It's absolutely fantastic. But, it, I mean, clearly, because, you know, it was only done last year, and this was about a month ago, wasn't about it? About a month ago, it had to be yeah. Done again. yeah. So this is going to be a recurring problem by the sounds of things. It, it seems like that. Um, well, I mean, why is it particularly bad? Because Sonar doesn't have that problem, does he? Well, we think it's mainly because to do is arthritic. Right. In her front shoulders. Yeah. And the fact that she limps, anyway... Yeah. So, of course, so you don't know whether she she's just limping because no. she's feeling a bit stiff. Uh, and or... if you think about it, if she's going up against a tree to scratch on it, yeah. then that's going to hurt. You know, she's actually pulling her weight on Absolutely. it. That's going to hurt her shoulders. So she tends not to do that so much. Right. So that's obviously one of the reasons why we, we basically try to, to check her yeah. before the nails grow into the pad. And, uh, but <laughs> you say that, I'm going to check a, tri a tiger's pads to make sure the claws are all right. Not terribly easy, if you they're think about it. They're not the easiest it. things to see, <laughs> because when they're normally let down, their yeah. feet are firmly flat yeah. on the floor. Yeah. Um, but we've d devised a method, well, Brian, I'll show you, I'll show you um, how it's done, yeah. of, of checking them. OK, go on, Brian. Let's see what... 
Well, what hopefully, to encourage her with a bit of meat to jump okay. up onto the cage so she put her claws oh, through. brilliant. Well, that's the plan. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have been trying it, but it doesn't always work. <laughs> OK. She's not looking terribly it interested is. at the moment. I'll just sort of encourage her over the first okay. one. There you go. Right. Oh. Good girl. She's looking pretty good, though, good I have girl. to say. Oh, she looks great. Right. You know, she's 20 yeah. years old, so... Come on, 20 now. Come yeah. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. Come on, girl. She's thinking about it. Oh, yeah. look at that. That's it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Now we can have a quick check. You can see... Now you, can, you could see that clipped claw on there very, yeah. Yeah. very closely, yeah. Very closely. Another one. But best of all, you can see that there's no damage to the pads. Yeah. And that is what you mainly look for. And so presumably, by being able to do this, by encouraging her to do this, you can get in kind Good of in the girl. nick of time. Yeah. And if they need clipping again, it can be done very quickly and, and hopefully with as little stress to her as possible. Yeah. Well, it's great to see her. Better and I am incredibly impressed, Brian, by your tiger training. <laughs> it's yes. Very, very <laughs> effective. Thank you both very much. And of course, we will be keeping you updated with Kadoo's progress throughout the series. The keepers from Longleat, who are out in Kenya, had to pull their weight earlier when a four year old male white rhino was captured. It proved to be a real battle of strength, but eventually, the sedative he'd been darted with kicked in. It's absolutely amazing. The rhino, which has been darted, is finally down. You can see they've put the towel over its eyes and they're just trying to secure it. So the keepers from Longleat are just hanging back a little bit over there, as is everyone else. And we're just waiting for Richard to give us the cue that he's happy for us to help load it into this box here. It's so exciting. Okay. Now what they're doing now is they're pouring water onto the back of the rhino because it's very dangerous that it could start to overheat. So that's to try and keep the body temperature down as low as possible before they get it into the crate and can then bring it round again. For the keepers, led by head warden Keith Harris, this is a valuable learning experience. Well, I mean, watching the teamwork and the preparation is, is to make sure... I mean, we do do that, but, again, I think this just drums it home to us that that is so important, and making sure everybody knows what they're doing, because if you get one person who doesn't, then you can cock it all up. And presumably for the keepers who are out here, it's a, a, it's a fascinating thing to watch, but they can take back the experience they've had to, oh, to your visitors and, yeah. and just for themselves. Yeah, I think it's invaluable just to, to, to be able to see this. Um, I mean, personally, I've been lucky enough to see it before, but the, you know, these guys haven't. So to, to go back, and it's when you're teaching um, other staff back at Longley, you know, at least you can say, hey, hang on, I've done it. Yeah. I know what I'm talking about. The Lewa team have relocated dozens of rhino before and they know that the safest way to get him into the crate is to help him to walk in himself, guided by ropes. But that means reviving the two-ton animal, and he may wake up feeling very confused and angry. If he panics at that point, he'll be extremely dangerous. What tough, what are you? you guys on this one? Yeah? Are there other guys on this one? Yeah? But you, you guys? You guys, we don't want to pull on this. OK. This is, this is to be left loose. OK. Just let it go in. OK. If it starts to back out, yes. then this is used as a steering. OK, so we're you, just steering rather yeah. than... Yeah, yeah. What they've done is they've attached a rope to a vehicle on the other side of this box, which they're going to start pulling the rhino through. And we're literally here in case it starts coming out this way. To, um, to make sure it doesn't injure itself as it goes into the box. Can you get some of the long guys on the ropes? Yeah. yeah. I can't believe they're about to bring this animal around, and it's still outside the box. I didn't realise it would come around so quickly. And um, the amount of force we had to, you know, put against it to get it in there is just amazing. This is, you know, one of the most dangerous animals in Africa. And, um, and we've seen so far to have got it successfully in the box. This really was an exciting moment. 
For Chris Campbell Claus, the manager of Kidgeo Reserve, who are taking the rhino, it's a momentous occasion. So, Chris, obviously this is your first sight of a rhino that's going to be moving to your conservancy. What, what are your thoughts? Well, it's fantastic. It, absolutely fantastic, because the last time a rhino would have been in the Rift Valley would have been 40 or 50 years ago. So it's, it's incredible that this is coming to us after all this time. Yeah. The rhino will be monitored very carefully. Capture stress, also known as capture myopathy, can be a serious problem. Yes, you know, it, it's been given a, a, a drug, nolofine, um, which, which assists in, in breathing, respiration. Um, but it, whatever happens, that animal will now go into the shade and will be closely monitored um, until we get the other one. For the keepers from Longleat, and especially Tim Yeo, it's been quite an experience. To see them living in a natural environment and to have been involved with the capture of one of these rhino and seeing how all that is put together has been incredible. And, and it certainly will help me when we're doing work with, our, with rhino at Longleat, even though we haven't got the vast areas uh, here which uh, you know, the, the, the capturing teams are, are operating in, it's still, we still see techniques uh, here that uh, will help us greatly. So now it's time to get this uh, crate on the back of the truck, and that's one rhino down, but we still have a second one to find, and this time it's going to be on much more difficult and dangerous terrain. There's danger afoot back at Longleat. Most of the animals in the East African Reserve lead a quiet life, grazing peacefully with their neighbours. But there's always one troublemaker in a community. And in this case, He's a hooligan called Trevor. I'm out in the East Africa Reserve with keeper Ryan Hockley and the very splendid looking Trevor, the male ostrich. Um, Ryan, just looking at him, one of the things that I notice about him, not so much today, but quite often, he's got a very pink beak yeah. and slightly pink legs, which the females don't have at all. Is that a sort of attraction thing? What's it is. It, it's, it's basically designed to, uh, to show the females and the other males as well that, that Trevor's sort of um, in quite a, a heightened state of being at the moment um, because he and Honey are currently sort of mating and, and she started laying eggs. Um, he's feeling very sponsy about the, the whole issue. Um, he's very protective towards Honey. Um, and, is, and is that why he's staying quite close to Honey? Is he sort of protecting her from us and sort of saying, definitely. you know, just, just watch out, don't yeah. come too close <clears throat> to my girl? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't think... Uh, I wouldn't want to step off the truck right now and, and approach Honey in any way, really. Does, um, does it make him much more aggressive and, and, and towards you? Yeah, yeah, although... I'd like, in, in sort of Trev's defence, I'd like to say defensive more than, okay. a, than aggressive. Yeah. Um, obviously, there are going to be times where he could just lash out at you, but I always sort of feel, we all feel up here, that a lot of the time you've got to do something to provoke a reaction. So, in a way, it's more defensive than aggressive. And with this movement of his wings, well, they're both doing it, but he seems to do it quite a lot. What's, what's going on there? Um, again, the wings are used as a major part of his mating display. Um, right. What he'll do, he'll actually hunker down on his legs and basically rock from side to side. It's called cantling. Right. And he'll rock from side to side um, and move in his feathers in such a way that it is a really appealing sight, actually, and I can't blame any female <laughs> for falling for it because it is, it, he puts so much effort in, he's got to get a result at the end of the day, really, for it. He's um, really magnificent he's close up, isn't beautiful he? He's a beautiful animal, yeah. Now, you had one successful chick last year. Yep. We can just see over there in the distance, lying yeah. down. Hoping for more this year? Definitely. We were pleased with the success we had last year because it was our, Al over there is our first mother reared chick. So, yeah. you know, we were really chuffed about that. But uh, obviously, we'd like to build on that this year, Kate. And <laughs> camels. <laughs> camels. Everyone's wanting camels. to come in and say, Oi, what about filming us? I'm sure somebody snuck a banana in their pocket. <laughs> a little bit surrounded now. We are totally <laughs> surrounded. Everybody's coming. He's not being too aggressive to the other animals in here or defensive with the no, other animals. No. But um, would he be if he felt that Honey was being, I don't know, threatened or crowded? Yeah, yeah, I think he would. I've, I mean, last year we saw, we saw Trevor defending, um, like I said earlier, the eggs. 
right. even possibly more than honey, very defensive over the eggs. And then how much of a part does he play in the rearing of the chick? He loves to get involved in that, in that sort of side of things and he's more than happy to have the chicks um, running around and following him and obviously from a, from a chick point of view um, they've got a much better percentage chance of surviving if they stay close to a big male like that than if they stay at, at mum's heel. So I think there's an instinct, a genetic instinct in those chicks um, to possibly, I don't know whether it's they see their dad as like the big black and white thing or whether it is about those red legs and they just basically stick to the red legs. Oh, well, um, yeah, that's a thought, and possibly I think even chicks that have hatched from other clutches will go with the most dominant male, who's probably the guy with the most vivid with the most pink legs. That's yeah. absolutely fascinating. Well, before um, <laughs> I get attacked by the camels, we probably should leave you all in peace. What do you say? Um, but, Cos, thank you very much. And, of course, we will keep our fingers crossed that all goes well and Trev's red legs pay off. <laughs> Out in Kenya again, the trackers are looking for a female rhino to join the male we helped to capture earlier. But in the meantime, I'm going to meet a rather special animal. I'm with David Parkinson, who's deputy director here at Lewa, and he's come to introduce me to Tula, a baby black rhino. Now joining us are Sarah Watson, who works for the Tusk Trust, who have a close affiliation here with Lewa, and um, Kaseya, who looks after this very frisky young rhino. So I suppose, first question is, how on earth did she end up here? Uh, good question, Ben. Tula is in fact our second baby rhino that we're hand rearing. Right. Both of the same mother, mm -hmm. who unfortunately is partially blind. Moingo is about 15 years old, okay. has already given birth to four children, mm -hmm. uh, and unfortunately, Two of them, because she can't see them, she loses them and right. they're easily predated. <laughs> she is very frisky. Uh, do, is. Do I, does she want some food by any chance? Yes. Yeah. And is that, has, 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 can, can, I, can I help with that? Yeah, so you're going to say, dear Mambia Maziwa. Dear Mambia Maziwa. Okay. So she wants to say, Masata to Pasito, Maratano Pasito. Okay. So basically, there is a giant bottle here, is there? Yeah, this is her. And she's still, how, how often is she fed? Yeah, five times a day. So do I just hold the bottle? Yeah, do you want, do you want some of that? She'll smell it. Whoa, look. That's a calm right now. <laughs> it's all calmer here yeah. now. <laughs> Peace and quiet. <laughs> and is it just milk? It's just milk. Yeah. It is um, eight pints a day and it's, it's actually powdered milk, right. um, which you just mix with water. So how does Kaseya literally look after her all the time? Yeah. Kaseya, when a cub yeah, he sleep, even sleeps with her. Really? He sleeps with her the whole day and the whole night. Now, a black rhino uh, in danger? Yeah, very endangered. She's so important because she is a female, so she's got great breeding potential. Right. Um, and that's why such care is taken of her, and you have someone like Cassia with her. Can, can, we, can we follow yeah, her over follow there? Her over. I, don't think, I think she's given up on, um, on the milk. So, literally, we're, you know, we're safe to be this close to a rhino, yeah. are we? Obviously, she's only. Yeni Makangapi Sasa. Yeni Makangapi. Yeah, I come with Siti Sasa. Yeah, she's nine months old. Right. Um, and she she'll be on milk for the next sort of until she's about eighteen months old. She really is frisky, like a little dog. I mean, yeah, jumping up and down. And things. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a little bit heavier. Have you any idea how much she might weigh? I guess about 400 kilos. Well, I'm not an expert. <laughs> that is quite amazing. And are you hoping that she'll return to the wild afterwards? That's the plan. Um, right. She's such, a, such an important thing because, you know, she's, she's the female. And, um, yeah. Look at that. The sound man. <laughs> the sound man got caught by the, the rhino almost. So you, you do hope that, um, that she will get One back One day, then. when she's about two or three years old, then, then she'll be returned to the wild. Right. Well, um, I think we should um, leave Kaseya <laughs> and Tula to run around. <laughs> Guys, thank you very much. Pleasure. What a treat. <laughs> you still want to play, don't you? And then you... Earlier today, we caught an older white rhino here, a four-year-old male, and he'll be moving later on to another reserve at Kijio as part of a programme to repopulate areas where rhinos have been wiped out by poaching. Rhinos attract tourists, so the income that they'll generate for the local community will give them a greater value than their horns. 
that Kijio needs a female as well so that the pair can breed. Lewa's head of security, Richard Moller, and his team of trackers have found one. But she's in very difficult terrain. We're on the hunt. There's some guys that have got it visual just down in this valley. Now, you, if you've, you, you, you can see that there's a potentially very dangerous uh, place to dart. Because of the, the undulating terrain, like just over the brow of this hill, there's, there's actually some cliffs. So if it was to run in that direction and then become drowsy and, and uncompassmentous, it, it will have the potential to you know, trip up, fall down a steep valley, break its neck, um, get caught in a tree. Uh, there, there's just too many things that can go wrong. With so much at stake, Richard and Francis Gakunga, the wildlife vet, need to approach very carefully. And this time, they won't even have the protection of the car. We found it down here. It's not in a brilliant place. Um, but we're just going on foot and just have a closer look and make a decision. What do we do if she charges the car? Reverse flat out. See you in a bit. When you're following a white, white rhino, the, the smell, the direction of the wind is, is vital. Its eyesight is pretty poor. Its hearing is relatively good, especially when you're close enough to dart it. But it's the smell that's, that's vital. There are men everywhere and also on the observation post in high places, trying to locate them. It's definitely um, some adrenaline. It's a, a real buzz, but at the same time, there is a scary element. It's not just rhino they have to worry about. There are lions in the long grass too, so they need to keep their eyes peeled. I think it's vitally important to, to keep your eye on that animal at all times. So, you, you know, you, you, if, if it is going to come at you, you you've, you've got a forewarning. If you're looking at the ground for a spore or whatever, you, you're straight away at, at a split second disadvantage. It's an exhilarating feeling, there's no doubt about that. But the rhinos got away. Even a two-ton animal can lose itself in this wilderness. They're particularly skitzy animals. I'm not saying they're, they're on the run flat out, but every time we get up to them, they, they, uh, they move on. And we, we've been at it now, what's it, nine, three hours since we did the other one. It, it's ridiculous. We had them within a stone's throw, and, and yet they've managed to slip the net. The team give up for the day. They don't want to stress the animal any more than is necessary by chasing her for hours. But they'll have to capture a female tomorrow, or the whole plan to re-establish a breeding population at Kijio will be in jeopardy. In the meantime, they've decided to send the male rhino on ahead. He's lightly sedated and securely roped to minimise stress on the journey. But some rhinos react badly and play up. Really angry rhinos have even been known to knock their own horns off. So when this one starts using his as a battering ram, we know we're in for big trouble. But then, even little rhinos can be a handful. Well, I'm back with Tula, the baby rhino, and Kissia and Dave, and apparently it's midday here and it's time Possibly for a bath. Dave, is that, do you think that's, that's what's going to happen? I think that's a potentially a good idea. To so, uh, this, this is basically to fill up this little, little, little hole here. And, um, and what do you think the likelihood of Tula actually going in is? She might want it. It's not desperately hot today, but um, she might want to cool down. Is she drinking from it like that? Yes, yes. Isn't that incredible? She has a very delicate skin. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, the other advantage of getting mud on her is when it dries, of course, mm -hmm. that she can rub the ticks off right. as well. Are they quite prone to ticks around here? Yeah, they can be, very much so. 
Because one always, one always assumes that um, they've got such a thick skin that, um, that nothing could damage it or hurt it. No, no, it's a very, very delicate skin. In fact, you can see ticks actually down here. Right. Under, you can under actually see some under there. Yes, you can, yes. And would those be, yeah. could you remove them or do, is it just let nature run its course? Nature and... just runs its course. Yeah. And as I said, the mud helps because, of course, the mud dries on the ticks and when she rolls, it pulls the ticks off. And have you ever, does she actually go into oh, here yes. and literally she loves it. wallow around? She loves it in there. Oh, go on. I really want to see you in there. Do you think that <laughs> Kissy is trying to entice her in? She really, every time I see her, uh, yeah, I, I think amazing, I'm falling yeah. more in love with her. Yeah, she's a... <laughs> Kissy definitely blanket. knows how to, yeah. how to attract her into the water. But she's still definitely a black rhino, as you can see. Yeah. <laughs> and in the wild, um, presumably, <laughs> look at her playing around, presumably in the wild, um, they would find these holes naturally if, if yes. they occur around yes. um, the conservancy here. Absolutely, yes. And literally, it would just be... I mean, would they spend a long time in a, in a wallow like that, not do you a, think? Not or? a massive amount of time, enough to cool, cool herself off, <laughs> get some mud on her, yeah. uh, and then come out. And in terms of drinking, how... I mean, does a rhino have to drink all the time like a, like a human? Uh, very much so. Yeah. Uh, she, she can go some time without drink, but, of course, at her, at her age, she very much relies upon her mother yep. for milk and would, um, regularly for yep. oh, a good well, look, two years. Well, she likes the camera as yeah, well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm not sure if she's going to want to go in today. Kissy is doing a very good job at, um, at attempting, but um, nope, no, she's heading shade. off that way. That's it. No, I think that, that's it for the day. Not hot <laughs> enough, I don't think. Never mind. Well, Dave and Kissy, thank you very much. Don't go away, because here's what's still to come on today's programme. After a dart in the backside and a lumpy, bumpy truck ride, this rhino wants a break. He's very agitated, so we've got to get, get him out now. And you may wriggle at the idea, pet owners, but you simply have to trim his teeth. They'll grow and grow and grow, and they can actually grow up into their own brain and actually kill them. No. So... Up in Lion Country, keepers Bob Trollope and John Stickley are checking on the latest arrivals to Mafui's Pride, Stumpy and Nala. Go on. Good girl. Come on, Cubby. There's always one, isn't there? Now four months old, they're Zazie's first cubs, and so far they've been living off her milk. Now they're old enough to start eating meat. What we're doing today is we've popped into Mafui's Pride and we've come to feed Sazzy and the cubs because the cubs are getting at some age now where they'll be tucking into this, you know, full hardly. Um, they've been actually pecking at it since about six weeks old. And as you can see now, they're a little bit older than that. What we do is we just place it down here, try and keep it out of the straw as best as we can because Otherwise, they take the straw in as well. A lot of noise at the moment, but then they're both probably hungry. Come on, cubbies. Good girls. Good girls. You're more likely to find now that Sazzy will just leave the cubs to it. Um, the cubs are a little bit suspicious of it because obviously Mum hasn't brought it into them, we've actually brought it in. Um, they'll, they'll just be checking it out first of all, and then as soon as they're confident that it's not going to get up and bite them, they'll, they'll jump on there and start eating at it. In the wild, the males always have the first go at a kill, and the cubs then have to fight for their food with the rest of the pride. Nala is the first to sink her teeth in, and she's already bigger than her sister Stumpy. They've been going great guns. Um, they've run slightly bigger than the other one, but then you, you would get that in a, in a litter. You know, you can't all have them the same size. One is going to be a little bit stronger, one is going to be much more dominant. And later on in life, you know, that bigger animal will most probably be uh, a high-ranking female within, within the pride. Meat is a vital element in the diet of growing cubs because of all the nutrients it contains. As adults, they'll eat nothing else. Lions are carnivores. At this age, they're also going to be going back to mum to take, take a drink from her. In a few months' time, she will dry up completely and they will be totally dependent on the meat. 
Mum's just taken a little bit off. Mum's ever so good, you know. From the, from the day they're born, they're, they're, you know, we, we're basically going to feed Mum as per normal. And, and they will watch her from an early age, see why she's going up to the meat, and learn from her from, you know, day one. <laughs> they're becoming little lions as such, you know, every day you see them, they're practicing on each other, fighting and hunting techniques, you know, basically trying to knock each other off. They play with mum, and that's all to do with learning the process of fending for themselves. And, you know, it's a marvellous thing to watch. You know, you can just see there now that the little cubby dug the claws in, and, uh, you know, that's gripping hold of the kill, so it doesn't get away. Well, all they normally do, they eat as much as they can and then uh, they go off for a bit of a siesta, wake up and then go back for a bit more. Zazie will continue to feed and teach the cubs until they're big enough to stand on their own four feet and face the world. It's daybreak in Kenya's Great Rift Valley. In Lewa, a spotter plane is already out looking for a female rhino to join the male we caught yesterday. He's now here at the Kijio Reserve as part of a programme to re-establish the endangered species where they've died out because of poaching. Kijio's manager, Chris Campbell Claus, is keen to get the rhino unloaded. This is phenomenal because it's the first time we've had a rhino on the property. He's the first one, and he's going to go into one pen on the left-hand side here. He's very agitated, so we've got to get, get him out now. Um, yeah, very excited. To minimise the stress on him, the young male will be released into this boma, which is the Swahili word for enclosure, rather than having to face a whole new territory straight away. But it's a dangerous moment. The four-year-old was sedated for the journey, and wildlife vet Francis Gakunga has just administered a reversal drug to wake him up. Rhinos are naturally aggressive, and this one, a hormone-fueled adolescent, is losing his temper and suddenly decides to batter his way out of the crate, whatever the damage. To everyone's dismay, the young rhinos rammed the crate so hard he's knocked off his horn. Fortunately, that's not as bad as it looks, because their horns are made of keratin, which is the same stuff as our hair and fingernails. Tim Yeo, who looks after the five white rhinos in Wiltshire, has come across this before. What we've seen just now looks horrifying. I mean, obviously it bleeds quite a bit and it looks as though, you know, it's, it's really painful, but uh, I'm sure it's more a case of being sore. It's like if you broke your nail right off, it would be obviously sore for a while. But at Longleat, we, one of our adult cows lost a, a horn, just fell off. I mean, uh, and we thought, oh my God, you know, what's going to happen now? And I mean, within months, this horn had, had grown back. It is just hair. You know, it, it will grow back very, very quickly. You know, the positive thing, in a way, is uh, it, it is the first time Rhino has been in this area for a long time, so he'll be, he'll be certainly a centre of attention. And one hopes, obviously, it's not going to be a centre of attention for poaching. Now that he's lost his horn, it's almost a positive uh, implication for us because our security on that Rhino won't be so <coughs> serious now. In the next... 24 hours, we hope he'll, he'll have another... Uh, the female will come in and accompany him, and that'll help him settle down. Even though he's not at all distressed, and the damage looks worse than it is, Francis Kakunga, the vet, isn't taking it lightly. I'm concerned about the infection of the wood. So I would like the animal to be monitored every other day and progress, report, report the progress will be given to me, so that I can know the... the the best way to handle the wood. But from experience, most of the animals, most of the wood of the horn heal very fast and the, and the horn starts growing. The rangers will keep an eye on him, but in the meantime, news has come through that a female 
Hopefully a future mate for this youngster has just been caught at Lewa, 150 miles to the north. It's vital that these two white rhino thrive. The future of the whole species depends on the success of projects like this. Since some of the keepers are half a world away in Africa, I thought I'd help out with some of the daily chores back at Longleat. I've come up to Pets Corner because it's MOT time, not for cars, obviously, but for animals, and I'm here with Julie Cutting. Hello, Julie. Hi, Kate. Who are we MOTing today? We're MOTing Duff and Dill, who oh. are two adorable little rats. Oh, Let me get this one up for beautiful. you. Beautiful. Do you know which one's You've got... which? Let me have a look at their bellies. Look, they've got different markings underneath. Oh, this one's yeah. Daff. And this one's Dill. Dil. Very <laughs> clever, because they look absolutely identical. They do. Now, is, is this a po an important thing to do with all the animals here at it Pets is, Corner? It is, really. To be honest, we we've got the animals out all of the time, like you would at home. You'd, yeah. you'd have them out and you'd be looking at them most of the time anyway, but just to give those essential few extra checks, <coughs> make sure their teeth are OK, make sure that they're breathing all right, any lumps or bumps, their claws are quite um, important to make sure they're not too long. OK, um, so if, if we start with... I've forgotten which one I've got now, Dill or Daff? That's Daff. This is Daff. <laughs> so if we start with Daff, um, I mean, she looks incredibly healthy and her coat's in very good condition. Is that, is that, is that a sort of good sign of health? With a, with a rat? Definitely. Shiny coat, lovely shiny coat. Most animals you want to see a nice glisten on their coat. So yeah. That's a good thing to look for. Okay. Um, means that they're having a good healthy diet and uh, they're getting all the nutrients that they need and uh, they're keeping themselves clean as well. They do like to keep themselves very, very clean despite their reputation. But yeah, people think that rats yeah. just are dirty and live yeah. in dirty places, but that's not true. Not at all. They just adore to be keeping themselves <laughs> clean. So um, you said claws is a thing. So let's have a look at your... Come on, show us your nails, dear. <laughs> now then, let's have a look. What, so what, what do you look for? Well, if they haven't got a suitable um, area, like a cage or, or where they're being let loose in, yeah. they can find that their claws might get quite long. So they need something to be um, quite abrasive to walk across. Maybe it's a bit of wood or oh, right. um, something quite hard and maybe a little bit rough. And that'll keep so that kind of files them down, it basically. Does. And anybody who's got a pet rat will know that sometimes when they're climbing up, you're the brilliant climbers, <laughs> as you can see. <laughs> yes. They will hang on dear life with those little claws, and it can hurt. It, yes. So uh, just keeping an eye on those so that they don't get overly long is yeah. quite a good idea. And teeth? How on earth do you check a rat's teeth? <laughs> well, these two are very fidgety. So what I'm going to do is just tip her up a little bit yeah. and, and just pull her teeth. Oh, heavens, they're really yellow. Does that they, mean she needs clean them not at all these guys actually have yellow or orangey enamel rather than white enamel so they're actually healthy teeth oh really? and you'll find that in most rodents to be honest so uh, not a problem with those at all another really really essential thing to look for in these guys and it's one of the major factors of why uh, uh, rats in the wild will die yeah it's because their teeth will grow and if it's not wearing away at their other teeth, they'll grow and grow and grow, and they can actually grow up into their own brain and actually kill them. No. So it's uh, quite essential to make sure that they're straight and they're growing in the right direction, otherwise you need to get them clipped. Now we do that ourselves when we're able to clip uh, any teeth that are too long, but right. recommend very much going to the vet and having and, that and done. getting that done. You don't want to cut them too short, Ooh, no. and you don't want to cut their lips either. And again, does diet help with that? If they're given certain foods, does that help keep teeth in good nick? Definitely. And actually, there's a lot of products on the market where you can buy little wooden flavoured things, and it's for all sorts of rodents and uh, rabbits as well. Yeah. And they'll gnaw on those and and keep their teeth keep down their teeth on that, in, so in good. Condition. Yeah. Look at you. <laughs> well, so fun. they are fun and they're beautiful. Thank you very much. That's We've got, um, I can't remember how many animals you've got in Pets Corner, but several hundred, and they've yes. all got to be MOT. <laughs> We've got our work cut out, haven't we? <laughs> Thanks, Julie. Okay. <laughs>The female rhino caught at Lewa in Kenya is on her way to the Kijio Reserve to join the four-year-old male, which the Longley keepers helped to catch. They're keeping a close eye on the wound where he knocked his horn off. And Chris Campbell Claus, who manages the reserve, has decided to spray it. It's an antibiotic I'm going to try and spray on that wound. Uh, but as much as anything as well, it's an insect repellent. So I'm just going to stop flies landing on that open wound at the moment. If we can do it, all the better. A ranger tries to lure the rhino with a snack. So if Patrick can bring him in close. 
I might be able to spray this onto his nose. At least his horn will grow back by the time he's a full-grown adult. And he won't have a problem in the meantime, because there aren't any other bulls at Kijio he might need to fight with. You see, the, the blood's beginning to clot, so, <clears throat> again, it's going to be dry by tomorrow morning, and then we probably won't have a problem with flies too much. Patrick, what I'll do, I think I'll leave this with you. Yeah. And if there's any opportunity you get, he, he does come very near you. OK. I think then, yeah. spray, but spray very hard, because, very hard. yeah, you want as much on there okay. in the shortest possible time. All right. The rhino's calm, but he's still wary. Attracting him this way may take a lot of time and patience. So Patrick tries a radical new tactic, imitating a female rhino. trying to make that noise, just to make him at least aware that there's maybe uh, something different next to him, maybe like a rhino or something like that, a company, or to make him feel comfortable that he's not lonely. <laughs> like if I keep doing again and again, sometimes it has to respond. So at least he, he does it after I do, he responds. Perhaps he just doesn't fancy Patrick. But fortunately, the real female has just arrived. But as the crate is prepared for unloading, there's some disappointing news. She's lost her horn on the journey too. Charlie Mayhew from the Tusk Trust, the charity that helped to sponsor this conservation programme, came down from Lewa with her. We put a little bit of uh, medicine, um, you know, so it doesn't get any infection. You know, the horn, in a way, is designed to, to, to come off relatively easily. So, you know, it's nothing to worry about. You know, the horn will grow back, and, and uh, it's just un unfortunate that both these rhinos have, have lost their horns. I mean, she, she's so much calmer than the first rhino. Fantastic, she went straight to the water. She's had a drink already. Very settled. Perfect, the perfect introduction into the boma, that was. The female is around three years old, and she's an adolescent too. She's released into her own section of the boma, because putting the two youngsters in together straight away could be dangerous. He's quite powerful enough to kill her if she doesn't take his fancy. But they will be able to smell each other. So, hopefully, he'll like her scent and a romance will blossom in time, which should help to perpetuate the species. Tusk and the Lewa team have moved many rhino before without them losing their horns. So it's surprising that both of these should have lost theirs. But Chris has a theory as to why it happened. A suggestion why those horns are coming off is because they're sub-adults. I think that's a very good point. And, and therefore they're, they're not rooted properly. Yeah. And they're going to be more vulnerable. Because if you, if you look on the inside of the, of the base of the horn that's come off, yeah. you can see that um, it, you know, it came away so easily. Absolutely. You know, there's very, almost like an artichoke, isn't it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. It's, 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 exactly. yeah. Both rhinos will be vulnerable to infection until their noses heal up. So they'll be kept under observation and the keepers will be taking no chances. I think we leave, leave them to be calm this evening, and tomorrow morning we'll assess the situation. We left the rhinos too, to go off and film lots of other wonderful animals that we'll be showing you more of in future programmes. But we couldn't resist dropping into Kijio a few days later to catch up with the young rhinos again. Chris, how are they getting on? Hey, and they're great. They're really settling down. And they're together? And they're together, which they weren't before. They didn't know each other before they came here. And how are they as expected, as the wounds where their horns broke off have healed up quickly, and they'll soon start growing new ones. You know, so we, we can only say this is fantastic. You know, it's no better way to end, really.
Absolutely, and presumably the, the larger one is the male and the, the slightly smaller is the female. Yeah, the, the male is four and a half years old and the female is about three and a half years old. And how long till, till kind of mating age? The male not until he's nearly seven and the female maybe five, so it'll be a couple of years yet. Right. Yeah. But hopefully there will at some stage in the next few years be a pitter-patter of even more rhino feeding. We hope, don't we? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Now, Patrick, yeah. I know that you've been looking after them and you're going to be keeping a close eye on them, aren't you? That's how, right. How do you feel about having two rhino here? Actually, I feel very happy. It's something new to us and actually, uh, I'm very happy about it because now we have the two rhinos here. So I'm happy spending the time with them here, feeding and mm -hmm. seeing how they do. Have you sort of bonded with them? Do you do, do, do they recognise you? Yeah, they recognise me because sometimes like, I can try to imitate them. How, can you do that now? Like. <sighs> and dangle some food Look down, I notice. Yeah. Look at that, see? Yeah, they are reactive. Look at the ears being backwards and forwards. Oh, that's how you can tell. Yeah. How, how do you yeah, do it? Can I try? Yeah, you can try. So you, I'll take some food as well, see if they want it. So I go. <gasps> Is that a good sign? Yeah, it is. Yes, yeah, they're picking up on what you're doing. Yeah. So I could well be a rhino whisperer, even yeah. though I live in England. Yeah. Why not? <laughs> <laughs> well, guys, how long, last question I suppose, is how long before they actually leave here for the, for the wilds of the reserve? I think confidently, say, in the next couple of days. Yep. Then we've got two free roaming rhino. And is there a buzz of excitement around? Oh, fantastic. You know, people in the community are ringing us up and saying, can we come and see your rhinos? And soon they will be able to. Well, the best of luck for the next few days and indeed the next few weeks. Thank you, thank you. Sadly, thank you. that's all we've got time for on this special edition of Animal Park. But what a way to finish the programme than with these two magnificent rhino waiting to be released into this magnificent reserve. In the meantime, here's what's coming up on the next Animal Park. Halt! Who goes there? The rangers in Kenya have to stop the poaching. This wildlife will be gone. It really will be gone unless somebody and the world does something about it. The Longleat Lions need a flu jab, but they don't like to take their medicine. That's a good shot from Brian. That was a very good shot. And why on earth would a giraffe in the wilds of Africa behave like this? That's all in the next Animal Park. <laughs>